Getting over in one era is a hard enough thing to do if you're a wrestler, but staying over all the way through to another era, well, that's another feat altogether. Yes, it takes a special kind of performer to keep that flame alive for so long that it passes beyond one phase of WWE into the next. But who are the best examples of superstars that succeeded in both the Attitude and Ruthless Aggression eras of WWE? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. And where better to start than with Triple H? That's right, while he might have gotten his start in the WWF during the New Generation era, it wasn't until the turn of the millennium that the game really found his footing. And that was because after forming D-Generation X with his best friend Shawn Michaels in 1997, he was able to become one of the key figures in the then burgeoning Attitude Era. Sure, he may not have been the biggest star of this era. After all, we're talking about a time period which featured the likes of Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. But you could make an argument that he was third place behind those, or was at least in competition with Mick Foley and The Undertaker for that spot. And that made him a very important part of a very important time for the company as a whole then, and meant he'd be a legend for as long as he wanted to stay in the ring thereafter. So it should come as little surprise that, after finally reaching the top of the mountain in 1999 and spending the second half of the Attitude Era winning the world title on multiple occasions, Triple H continued to find himself at the highest points of the card all the way through to the new Ruthless Aggression Era when this was birthed in 2002. And what's more, during the early days of that period you could actually argue he was the top star. Certainly he was the biggest name on Raw, a sign on just how much he'd been able to level up in such a relatively short space of time. Yes, it helped that by then Steve Austin was all but gone and The Rock already had one foot out the door on his way to Hollywood. But even if we discount such facts, Triple H was always going to be a bigger deal than ever during the early 2000s, as by this point he'd become a full-blown member of the McMahon family. So there was no way he wasn't going to use such a thing to his advantage and reap all the rewards it afforded him, with those rewards including a new stable of his own in the form of evolution, further world title wins, and pretty much free range to do what he wanted on Monday nights. Really, you could argue that for as much of a success as he was during the prior era, it was the time of ruthless aggression which saw Paul Levesque truly reach his final form, that of an unbeatable behemoth in the vein of Harley Race. Hell, even when Shawn Michaels returned to the ring in 2002 following a period of temporary retirement, it didn't slow down the game's progress, as so high had he risen now, he was arguably the bigger star than even HBK. But Triple H wasn't the only Attitude Era star who arguably became an even bigger deal during the Ruthless Aggression Era, because the exact same thing could be said about our next subject too, Edge. Of course, in Edge's case, it was a given things were going to play out this way for him, because while he might have been a frequent highlight of the late 90s, he was never exactly a main event player. No, his role on the show back then was mostly to serve as a tag team act alongside his real-life best friend Christian, with the two playing a major part in reinvigorating the division in WWF once more. Need any examples of how great they were? Just look at the series of TLC matches they had against the Dudleys and the Hardys. That said, even during this period, there were already signs that Adam Copeland was going to break out on his own as a solo act eventually, as management clearly saw him as the bigger star. Hell, this was exactly why he was booked to not only win the King of the Ring in 2001, but also become Intercontinental Champion around that same time. So it should come as little surprise that once the era of ruthless aggression fully took hold starting in 2002, the Toronto native would be a major project for Vince McMahon, as with him having the look, the in-ring skills, and the talent required on the mic, Edge really was a complete package already. All it was going to take was the right environment for him to break out entirely, and that environment turned out to be SmackDown. Yes, it was here during the first brand extension that the Canadian found his groove as a solo act by becoming a member of the famed SmackDown 6, that sextet of superstars who frequently locked up with each other in various combinations during the early 2000s and made the blue brand the place to watch as a result. And because of that then, you were pretty much always guaranteed to get a good match whenever Copeland stepped into the ring, as his opponents included the likes of Rey Mysterio, Chavo Guerrero, and a couple of other people we'll get to in a moment. Honestly, you could argue that even more so than his time spent redefining tag team wrestling in the WWF, it was this period which fully saw Edge blossom into the man he'd go on to become during the PG era, and that was a multiple-time world champion. 
In fact, depending on where you put the cutoff point, you could argue that his first world title run came while the Ruthless Aggression era was still in full swing, as this happened in January of 2006 when he became the first person to cash in the Money in the Bank contract. But let's move on from Edge for a moment and over to another member of that famed SmackDown 6 we haven't yet mentioned, one who also made their name during the prior era. Who are we talking about here? Why, Kurt Angle, of course. Of course, it really should come as no surprise that Kurt Angle was able to find success in multiple eras of WWE, as he's arguably the greatest in-ring performer of all time. Someone who can easily stand alongside other GOAT contenders like Bret Hart, Ric Flair, and Brian Danielson. What makes it so notable that he was able to succeed in both the times of Attitude and Ruthless Aggression, however, was that he was still very much a baby in wrestling terms back then. After all, he didn't actually have his first match until late 1999, by which point the Attitude Era was already in full swing. And sure, we know he'd already won a gold medal in amateur wrestling at the 1996 Olympic Games by then, but just because you're a great amateur doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a great pro. For Kurt, though, this was never an issue, as he quickly proved himself to be an absolute prodigy, someone so superhumanly good that by the time the autumn of 2000 rolled around, he'd be closing out his rookie year by pinning The Rock to become WWF Champion. And after that, Pittsburgh's favorite son would spend the second half of the Attitude Era firmly locked in the main event scene, as he regularly got a chance to lock up with the likes of Steve Austin, Triple H, and The Undertaker. But for as great of a feat as this was, it was arguably what came next which fully solidified Angle as an all-time legend, because once the era of ruthless aggression dawned, he'd be that much more experienced and that much more ready to fully fly the flag of the SmackDown brand. And a large part of this happened during his time with the SmackDown 6, because this was where he had a seemingly never-ending array of great singles and tag team bouts alongside the other members of the collective. That said, this wasn't the only peak he reached during the time period. No, as if having one great run per era wasn't a big enough deal, Kurt also helped establish the blue brand even earlier than that by having an absolutely excellent program with Brock Lesnar, one which saw the two go on last at WrestleMania 19 ahead of Stone Cold and The Rock. That's right, if you needed any further evidence of how well the Olympic hero handled the transition from one era to the next, you can always look to the fact he headlined the biggest show of the year, all while enduring the type of neck injury which would have crippled most other men. But then, when has Kurt Angle ever been a normal man? No, this is the guy who won his Olympic gold medal with a broken freaking neck. Does this make him better than our next subject, though? The as-of-yet unnamed sixth member of the SmackDown 6, the late, great Eddie Guerrero? Come on now, we couldn't do a video covering this subject without at some point coming to Latino heat. After all, while he might not have been in WWF during the early days of the Attitude Era, busy as he was over in WCW, by the time 2000 came around, he decided it was time for him and the rest of his band of radicals, namely Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, and Perry Saturn, to make the jump to the Fed. And it's just as well he did this then because in Atlanta, backstage politics meant there was always going to be a ceiling on how high Eddie could go with the company. In the WWF though, things were different. And that was why he was able to spend the second half of the Attitude Era developing an all-new aura for himself as Latino Heat, a roguish heel who was so charming in his ability to lie, cheat, and steal his way to victory, it wasn't long before audiences started to fall in love with him. But then how could they not, because with his mamacita, China, by his side, he was frequently among the most entertaining things on the whole show. Unfortunately, though, any momentum he was building up would temporarily be stalled when in late 2001, he was fired after his drug issues got the better of him. That said, for as sad as this was, it wouldn't be the end of the Eddie story, because by the spring of 2002, he'd have worked his way back into the good graces of WWE, and would, as a result, be invited back into the company, right as they were making their transition into a more ruthless aggression-filled era. How would Eddie handle this environment? Better than anyone could have ever imagined as it happened, because after making his mark on the blue brand as part of the aforementioned SmackDown 6 and really getting a full grasp on his character work in the process, Eddie ascended to the highest level when in February of 2004, he defeated Brock Lesnar to become WWE Champion in one of the most cathartic moments in wrestling history. And now that he had been formally crowned, the El Paso native was absolutely able to dominate the main event scene for the next couple of years, all the way up until he tragically died before his time of acute heart failure in November of 2005. Would we have loved to see how Eddie would have fared heading into the likes of the PG era and beyond? 
Sure, it would have no doubt been something special to witness, but at least we got to see him do his thing across two eras of WWE. And during that time, we also got to see him have a lot of great matches with our next subject, the one, the only, Chris Jericho. Now, like with Eddie Guerrero, Chris Jericho wasn't in the WWF during the initial days of the Attitude Era, as at that point he was busy working for WCW as part of their cruiserweight division. Of course, this would all change on the August 9th, 1999 episode of Raw, however, as that was the point Y2J had one of the greatest debuts of all time when he showed up unannounced on the Red Brand. And while what followed may have been a little ropey at first, Come 2000, Jericho was starting to find his footing as a solid upper mid-card act in the WWE system, someone who could always be relied upon to have a great match with the likes of Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit, or Eddie Guerrero. The only problem with that, though, was that this wasn't enough for him. No, he wanted to go to the absolute top of the card. So it's just as well for him, then, that he'd eventually reach this peak, when in December of 2001, right around the time the Attitude Era was making the transition into the Ruthless Aggression Era, he beat Steve Austin and The Rock back to back on the same night to become the first ever undisputed world champion. And after that, it was off to the races, because from there, he'd main event WrestleMania 18 with Triple H, have some banger feuds against the likes of Shawn Michaels and Christian, and would even get to settle an old WCW beef with Bill Goldberg over on Raw. And this wasn't all, because on top of that, during the Ruthless Aggression Era run, Y2J would not only receive on-screen credit for creating the Money in the Bank ladder match, but he'd become an at-the-time record seven-time Intercontinental Champion, too. So really, you could argue there was nothing he didn't do during the early 2000s. Of course, he would take a hiatus away from the ring in 2005, though, in order to focus on his band Fozzie, so he ended up missing the transition to the PG era. But one person who was certainly there for not only that, but also the Attitude Era prior, was our next subject, The Undertaker. But then why wouldn't The Undertaker be there? After all, he's pretty much been the eternally constant figure of the company from the early 90s up until very recently. But while this means he was a major star and multiple-time world champion long before the period of Attitude ever came around, that's not to say he didn't reach some of his highest peaks during the late 90s. Need we remind you about his feud with Kane, maybe the best program Mark Calloway ever had? And if that isn't selling you yet, then how about the matches he had with Steve Austin in 1998, his hostile takeover of WWF as the leader of the Ministry of Darkness in 1999, or his transformation into the American Badass in 2000? Yes, during the Attitude Era, there was never a single point where the dead man didn't feel like one of the most important parts of the entire show. And that vibe would continue all the way into the next era too as it happened, because when ruthless aggression dawned, he'd remain at the mountaintop, though now he'd be doing it under a slightly different incarnation of Big Evil. Who was Big Evil? Well, he was basically a heel American badass. And it was with this character that the Phenom made Raw and SmackDown his yard throughout the first half of the 2000s, with him using his status there to help get the next generation of talents over, names like Jeff Hardy, Brock Lesnar, John Cena, and even Maven. But that wasn't the last incarnation of The Undertaker we'd see during the Ruthless Aggression era, because after years of fan demand, in 2004, at WrestleMania 20, he'd finally cave and return to his old Deadman incarnation, with this seeing him reach another level altogether by turning the streak into an annual spectacle with his WrestleMania 21 match against Randy Orton. And after that was established, Mark Calloway's role going forward on WWE TV as the gatekeeper was firmly solidified, meaning he'd always be a weekly presence for the remainder of that era and beyond. It didn't matter if it was JBL, Batista, Edge, or anyone else, if someone wanted to stake their claim at being a main eventer, then they were at some point going to have to go up against the Phenom. But what about the yin to The Undertaker's yang, someone who also found much success in both the Attitude and Ruthless Aggression eras? Yes, it's time for us to talk about the kayfabe brother of the Lord of Darkness, the Big Red Machine, Kane. Now, we've already briefly talked about Kane's debut back in 1997, but let's go into a little more detail about it now, because it truly is one of the all-time greats. Basically, back then, Paul Bearer had just recently revealed a secret to the world, and that secret was that The Undertaker's brother, someone who had long been thought dead, was in fact still alive. What followed on from there then was months of whispers and speculation as wrestling fans everywhere tried to figure out when exactly Kane was going to arrive. 
And on October 5th's Bad Blood in your house that year, all the speculation was finally put to bed when in the first ever Hell in a Cell match, Glenn Jacobs debuted by ripping the door of the cage off of its hinges and laying out his brother with a tombstone pile driver. Needless to say then, this was quite an impactful debut, and it instantly rocketed Kane up to the level of being one of WWF's top heels going forward. So much so, that by June of the following year, he'd have defeated Steve Austin to become WWF Champion. But that wasn't the only success the Devil's Favorite Demon would find during the Attitude Era, because alongside his partners The Undertaker and X-Pac, he'd also become a multiple-time Tag Team Champion as well. The only question left then was once the company transitioned to the era of ruthless aggression around 2002, would Kane be able to keep up this same momentum? Well, the answer to that was yes, because after taking off his mask later that year and completely reinvigorating himself in the process, Glenn Jacobs went on to become an even more fearsome figure than ever, someone who was able to get involved in countless memorable moments such as his love triangle with Matt Hardy and Lita, his super heavyweight tag team with The Big Show, and of course the whole Katie Vick saga. Actually, let's just uh, forget about that last one. No, instead, focus on just how versatile Kane proved himself to be back then, with this giving his bosses so much faith in his malleability as a character that it's not surprising he would continue on for decades after. Of course, while Kane might have lasted well into the 2020s though, it's really those first two runs in the Attitude and Ruthless Aggression eras which saw him reach his peak. And you could argue the exact same thing is true about our next subject, a former tag team partner of his who we mentioned a moment ago, The Big Show. That's right, it didn't matter if it was the Attitude Era or the Ruthless Aggression Era, Paul White was a constant force on the WWE roster throughout the late 90s and early 2000s. And it all started for him in February of 1999, as that was when, following a successful run in WCW which saw him become a multiple-time world champion, he made his WWF debut in the most dramatic way possible when he burst out from under the ring during a steel cage match between Steve Austin and Vince McMahon. And after that moment got him established with Fed fans, it was off to the races for the big show, as by the end of the year, he'd have pinned Triple H to become the new WWF champion. Sure, he may have hit a few lulls following this as his momentum slowed down, but by the time the Ruthless Aggression era was dawning in 2002, he was back to full power. How would this first present itself? Well, with him once again becoming WWE Champion when he beat Brock Lesnar for the honor at that year's Survivor Series. And while the subsequent title run may have been a short-lived run on top in the grand scheme of things, it was enough to reinvigorate the giant once more, as from there, he settled into a groove as an upper mid-carder who could move between the role of babyface and heel with ease, depending on what was asked of him that particular week. Hell, at this point, he'd even technically win a world title once more when in 2006, he became the champion of WWE CW, the most hardcore of all promotions, and when he wasn't busy doing that, he was back on the main roster either having tag team runs with Kane or working as a surrogate for Vince McMahon during his feud with DX. But while this made the Big Show a quietly valuable player during both those eras, even he could never pretend to be as big of a deal as our next subject, the man who absolutely dominated the Attitude Era, and at least the first part of the Ruthless Aggression Era, The Rock. Yes, he may not have been around for long after his Hollywood heel run in 2003 came to a close, but Dwayne Johnson was still a key factor in helping WWE transition from one period to another with as little upheaval as possible. But then, that was something he was all too qualified to do by that point, because as we mentioned a moment ago, during the Attitude Era, there was no bigger star than him outside of Steve Austin. And even then, there were points where you could argue Dwayne Johnson was the bigger name of the two, as during 2000 in particular, he absolutely carried the company on his back as its top babyface. Then there's the fact that after getting catastrophically over with fans in 1998 as the People's Champion, he'd go on to main event WrestleMania's 15, 16, and 17, as well as have all-time great feuds with the likes of Mick Foley, Triple H, Vince McMahon, and more. So when it came time to leave the Attitude Era behind then, there was no better person to carry the torch for WWE, especially as Stone Cold had only just left the company following a dispute with Vince McMahon over his booking. And all that ultimately led to arguably the Great One's greatest incarnation, Hollywood Rock, the cocky heel turned up to 12 who had countless memorable moments with the likes of Goldberg, Hulk Hogan, and even the Hurricane. 
And none of this is even mentioning the fact that in putting Brock Lesnar over Strong at SummerSlam 2002, Rocky did what many others in his position would be too selfish to do, fully pass on the torch to the next generation while he was still in his prime himself. And this truly solidified The Rock as not only a great of the Attitude Era, but also the Ruthless Aggression Era too. But then, the same thing could be said about everyone else we've discussed today, as they each, in their own way, deserve to be counted amongst those rare legends who managed to cross generations.